Uh, welcome everyone to the third Sephiroth lecture. My name is uh, David Inez. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance. And I'm also part of the Sephiroth project. As some of you might already know, uh, Sephiroth is a three-year re three research project which is examining separation of powers in the 21st century European Union. It's a joint effort between three universities, the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance, the University of Amsterdam, the Eric Kastren Institute of International Law and Human Rights at the University of Helsinki, and the Center for European Research at the University of Gothenburg. So um, today we have the pleasure of having with us Lilian Surti. Um, she's an assistant professor and uh, Dutch Research Council grantee at the Law Faculty of Maastricht University. And she's also a visiting professor at Sciences Po Paris. So her research interest uh, span EU law, public international law, public policy administration, and she's specifically interested in human rights, asylum, migration, and governance theories. So um, Lilian, today she will focus on the changing nature of the EU executive power in migration policy, and particularly on the role of the EU agencies. So um, without further ado, um, Lilian, the floor is yours. And many thanks once again for accepting our invitation. And we hope to have quite some time also for a Q&A after to discuss your presentation. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Davide, for this kind introduction. And many thanks also to Christina for inviting me to give this talk. I will uh, share my screen and I hope that the technology will be uh, favorable. Uh, so, uh, do you see what I see? An active PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. So uh, I will be tackling today shifting executive power in EU's uh, migration policy. And I will be focusing more specifically in uh, implementation mode shifts through EU agencies. And I'm drawing from a series of uh, articles and book chapters uh, that I have recently published or that are forthcoming. I believe that you received uh, the first one from the German Law Journal, those who registered at this talk. But there is also some uh, further literature that I'm uh, drawing on. There is this interdisciplinary publication on the role of EU agencies in the Eurozone and migration crisis. Uh, then we co-authored a chapter with Catherine Costello in the evolution of uh, EU law, where uh, we are focusing on the evolution of EU law on refugees and asylum. This will be the third edition of a quite famous book of Professors Craig and De Berka. And I'm also drawing uh, from a recent uh, blog post, uh, which is part of a dedicated series on the new pact on migration and asylum at the Odysseus Academic uh, Network uh, blog. So conceptually, uh, where is my presentation? Uh, situated. So administrative integration in borders and asylum actually followed to a great extent the classical uh, model uh, which has been conceptualized as executive federalism. Namely, well, uh, the EU level legislates and then in most cases it is up to the national executives to apply EU law, but as in other areas also of EU law, we are actually witnessing shifts and the emergence uh, of a European administration as an integrated uh, system between the EU and national levels. And the analytical perspective is this interdisciplinary perspective between law and public policy. And it is that of administrative governance. So this uh, allows us to capture interactions between the EU and national levels in implementation, many of which are taking place de facto, and they have not uh, yet actually been uh, expressed uh, in EU law, as you will see 
later on in my presentation. I will be focusing on two main trends, so two main uh, shifts. So the first is uh, a shift of a move from practical cooperation towards joint uh, implementation, and I will be analyzing the emergence of some joint implementation patterns. This initially uh, took place as part of the so-called hotspot approach to migration management, which was an operational framework of interagency uh, cooperation uh, and cooperation with national authorities in uh, implementing migration management actions at EU borders, but it has moved away and it is spreading also far beyond uh, this initial, let's say, uh, example. And the second, which is also less known and less covered, is the emergence of monitoring and steering functions uh, through EU agencies. So I will be focusing on two uh, main agencies, uh, Frontex, so the European Border and Coast Guard, but I will keep uh, referring to it with its uh, initial uh, name. And there we have these shifts actually uh, taking place uh, de jure. So we have in the latest iteration uh, of the regulation actually a quite far reaching uh, provision uh, where European integrated uh, border management is actually uh, explicitly referred to as a shared responsibility of the agencies and of, of the agency and the national authorities responsible for border management. And we have had these patterns of joint implementation as part of the operation of Frontex already since uh, more than a decade. So in our minds and, and what you may be, uh, those who are not specialized in migration, what you have in mind with a joint implementation is often this Frontex deployments, these naval operations or uh, joint operations uh, at borders. These have grown uh, both in terms of financial and in terms also of human resources and the latest regulation of 2019 has a very ambitious uh, vision of uh, 10,000 actually uh, a statutory core of, of 10,000 which will consist of so-called statutory staff so people employed by Frontex itself uh, member state staff for long-term deployments, so experts that the member states will make available for deployments of at least 24 months, and member state experts for shorter-term deployments, so less than 24 months, but all of that will uh, raise to uh, an impressive 10,000 uh, by 2027. Things are not so clear cut in the case of EASO. So the other agency that I will be covering this is the European Asylum Support Office. So their shifts have taken place de facto because the Euro, we had actually, uh, we still have the original version of the regulation, which has not been amended once since 2010, uh, where member states were initially very cautious and the regulation excludes direct or even indirect powers in relation to the taking of decisions by member states. Here I am referring to the examination of individual asylum applications. So the agency was to have absolutely nothing uh, to do with them, neither directly nor indirectly. It was supposed to undertake different types of activities, uh, sharing of country information, training, etc., etc., but nothing uh, close to what we have in mind as operational. But things have shifted since the 2015 2016 
a crisis which I understand more as a governance crisis rather than as a refugee crisis, as it had to do more uh, with the weaknesses of our arrangements and, and the legal design of the instruments rather than the large numbers of asylum seekers that arrived. And what happened there initially also, as I told you, within the framework of this so-called hotspot approach to migration management. Well, as we didn't have a change in EU legislation, we had the change in national Greek uh, legislation, so national administrative law. In April 2016 and consecutively in June 2016, which introduced accelerated uh, procedures at the border and, and admissibility uh, stage, which actually serves to weed out applications uh, for return, uh, if you want to uh, Turkey, understood as a safe third country. And uh, this uh, involvement then of EASO in this uh, processing takes place through Greek law, and it was later uh, actually uh, further uh, developed to also extend to the stage of the merits, so not only uh, admissibility. And what exactly is the role of these EASO deployed experts? They independently conduct uh, interviews, whether the admissibility uh, interview, uh, whether uh, the merit interview, and they emit a non-binding opinion to the Greek Asylum Service. So the Greek Asylum Service is the one responsible to adopt the final decision, is the one that stamps, uh, let's say, uh, the official document, but based actually on an interview which has been undertaken uh, by the deployed experts. So this, these were some examples of these joint implementation patterns, but I mentioned to you that I would be covering also uh, acts that have a steering potential, so potential to steer uh, policy implementation. And in Frontex, again, this has happened uh, de jure. So we have uh, the adoption of a technical and operational strategy for European integrated border management, which is uh, actually adopted in a collaborative uh, cycle between Frontex and the European Commission. So as part uh, of a multi-annual strategic policy cycle. This is the, uh, the jargon uh, in the regulation, but where on this basis of the operational strategy adopted by Frontex, then each uh, member state has to adopt its own uh, strategy in uh, implementing this. And in the future uh, EASO, so the European Asylum Support Office, which is to be uh, revamped into an EU agency on uh, asylum, uh, we will have, it is not taking place uh, for the moment, a kind of common analysis, which you should understand as a, a common position on country of origin information. By that, I mean, uh, what is the situation in a particular country of origin where refugees, uh, let's say, are uh, coming from. And this will be endorsed uh, by the management board. So it will be quite an authoritative, if you want, it will not be legally uh, binding, but it will have this uh, soft, if you want, uh, steering potential and quite an authoritative uh, value as it will have been endorsed by the management board of the agency, which is uh, primarily member state dominated. And then it is going to circulate in the different national administrations that have to decide uh, on individual asylum applications. And then we have the emergence of monitoring uh, functions. Again, in the case of Frontex, this is already uh, a legal reality. 
So we have the liaison uh, officers of Frontex who are responsible for information uh, collection uh, and reporting, and they are also linked with the so-called vulnerability assessment. Uh, what do I mean by that? It is an assessment of capacities uh, at national level, so readiness, uh, let's say, um, and an estimation of the potential consequences on the functioning of the Schengen area where these vulnerabilities, uh, for example, are being identified in a particular member state. And there is a whole structured process of what can happen on the basis of the results of this uh, vulnerability assessment, which first is a stage, a kind of dialogue stage between the member state and the agency and the management board, but it can in uh, further uh, stages through also the involvement of the Council of the European Union end up in a binding recommendation uh, of deployments in uh, the, the member state territory. And once again, uh, where it concerns asylum, so the EASO or the future European Union Agency on Asylum, we have such a, a mechanism being envisaged. So it is under uh, negotiation and it is going to a large uh, extent mirror this vulnerability assessment. So a kind of monitoring uh, exercise to monitor the operational and technical application of the common European asylum systems to identify shortcomings and also, again, through a similar uh, structured process, starting with a kind of dialogue, again, uh, between uh, the agency and the member state, but then uh, through the involvement of the Commission and uh, later the Council, it could end up, uh, well, theoretically, as all this is under negotiation, to a binding recommendation that, again, uh, could lead to uh, deployments uh, in uh, member state territory. So how has the pact, there has been a new policy initiative, the new migration pact on asylum, uh, on asylum and migration, uh, which is a kind of overarching commission communication of this uh, September that also uh, was followed by a barrage of uh, legislative uh, proposals. How does this uh, shift things when it comes to the agency mandate. It does not foresee uh, something new uh, for Frontex. And actually the Frontex regulation, as you may also have gathered so far uh, from my presentation, is overall, overall attuned uh, to realities on the ground. It has been consecutively uh, adapted. Here uh, you will see uh, already uh, five times. This is not the case with the ASPA, uh, where actually developments uh, in the regulation have stalled uh, because there has been this so-called package approach. So there are some, there were some other proposals uh, to, in fact, amend different uh, elements of the common European asylum systems, uh, system, and as they were stuck correlatively, uh, also this uh, proposal for a new European Union agency on asylum has been stuck since 2016. We had a political agreement on several aspects, but not all of them in late 2017. Then we had the commission coming with some further targeted amendments in uh, 2018. And uh, actually the commission left the co-legislators to uh, actually try uh, to find a compromise on the basis of all uh, these instruments. And by the way, to actualize them with uh, the rest of the elements of the package because there have been uh, proposals, for example, 
on a new approach to responsibility sharing, to screening at the borders, et cetera, et cetera. So that, but these are of course not mirrored in these instruments of 2016, 2018. So it is left up to the co-legislators actually not only to find a compromise, but to scan uh, through the instruments uh, and to try to actualize it, so to speak. And while there was an initial hope uh, by the German presidency that this would have happened quite uh, quickly, this has not uh, been the case, as I also slightly foresaw in this blog post uh, that I uh, mentioned to you. And uh, for now, uh, this instrument is uh, stuck once again. So what about then the rest of the pact instruments? Because I told you that there is a, a whole barrage of other uh, legal uh, instruments. So my take is that they do not satisfactorily embed these new uh, functions of EU agencies, as I told you, this monitoring joint uh, implementation. And an example, we can see an example of uh, the role of the European Asylum Support Office and the envisaged border procedures, where, as I told you, uh, its role in Greece has been seminal and has had to be, uh, let's say, regulated only at national law, as we have a gap uh, for now uh, at uh, EU law. What uh, the regulation says about these border procedures is that yes, EASO can support member states with staff within its mandate. And uh, indeed, these proposals, the 2016 and the uh, 2018, ingrained uh, some elements of uh, common processing. But the border procedure in the pact does not fully reflect the procedural uh, implications and the accountability implications, which I will touch upon uh, in a while. It just has this uh, vague, let's say, provision of EASO can support uh, member states, but then it does not draw the implications of what this shared uh, administration model, what this involvement uh, of EASO means procedurally and uh, in terms of accountability. Also, another thing that, it, that has happened is that the pact ingrains a two-track approach to administrative cooperation. And by that, what is the two-track? Well, the one track, I have been uh, hammering your head about it. It is this integration, shared administration through EU agencies. The other is uh, interstate uh, collaboration. And we can see this two-track approach through this new concept of return uh, sponsorship. What is a return sponsorship? So a member state commits to return irregular uh, migrants on behalf of another member state, carrying out all the activities necessary. So to take a very simple example, uh, a failed uh, asylum seeker uh, is in Greece and should be uh, returned, let's say, according to our legal instruments. And Hungary uh, will be involved as a return sponsor, trying to help Greece uh, to uh, carry out all the activities necessary. And if this return has not been completed in eight months or four months when there is an emergency, Hungary is to transfer uh, this uh, irregular migrant at that point to its territory and continue, let's say, uh, the, the return from there. So such activities are additional to the ones carried out by Frontex. And one uh, of the major changes, let's say, in the 2019 regulation is this much more intense role that Frontex has been given in uh, coordinating and actually being implicated uh, through joint implementation of uh, return uh, activities. And this enhanced role in return policy has uh, come with enhanced fundamental rights guarantees. Now, we will discuss to what extent uh, these are enough 
uh, in uh, just a few moments, but just to say that this framework, let's say, with whatever defects exists uh, for Frontex, does not exist uh, per se, will not be able to cover these situations of interstate uh, collaboration. So there we have a multi-actor uh, situation and even less uh, guarantees and further difficulties, practical difficulties uh, for the individual that will be uh, seeking, uh, for example, access to justice uh, in violations that will take uh, place as part of this foreseen interstate uh, cooperation. So I come back, I have told you, uh, as this is also a broader uh, project, I have identified here uh, four main challenges that I believe uh, are also crucial and of importance for your project to uh, look uh, further into when looking into this shift of executive power through EU agencies. So the first is a balancing joint implementation and supervision. So I mentioned this emergence and, and prevalence of, of uh, joint uh, implementation, which is linked with shared responsibility. I quoted the Frontex regulation where this has been also stated explicitly. And at the same time, we have this emergence of these monitoring-like functions, which are supplementing to an extent the commission supervision mandate. So this vulnerability assessment, this monitoring mechanism. So we have these two limbs, joint implementation and, and supervision. On the one hand, we can say, oh, there are some synergies that are being created here. So we are going to identify these weaknesses and then uh, we are going through these processes that I didn't manage to describe in detail, but which uh, exist, actually, for example, recommend agency presence and deployment, et cetera, et cetera. So they will be maybe to an extent addressed. But we also have this underlying tension because the agency that is called to jointly implement actually and be involved in one-on-one -on -one interactions also with migrants and asylum seekers is at the same time called to monitor uh, this implementation. And there, of course, we see uh, an obvious tension, which also uh, relates uh, to the issue of independence. And I will focus also a bit more on that in, in a following observation. So it has to do also with the internal governance uh, structure of, of the agency, uh, which is so their management boards, which is member state dominated and which has extensive power, uh, let's say, uh, and involvement. So here the related challenge is that of independence or dependence, uh, if you will, and of finding ways to further enhance the role of external expertise, for example, in monitoring or in the co-production of outputs, such as this country of origin information, uh, common positions, so that they will counter uh, balance to be a counter way uh, to an extent to this uh, extensive role uh, that the management board has. So another uh, challenge is ensuring fundamental rights uh, oversight and accountability. And I don't need to be uh, the one to reflect on that because uh, I'm sure that you are all following the news uh, and that you have been uh, following the allegations, for example, of Frontex involvement in uh, pushbacks at the EU-Turkey uh, uh, sea border, so Greece-Turkey, uh, or, uh, for example, at the Hungary-Serbia uh, border, which led uh, even uh, to uh, the agency withdrawing uh, its presence from Hungary. So the issues are real. Uh, we know them more in the framework of external border control and uh, Frontex, but they are real also in terms of asylum uh, processing uh, in uh, EASO, 
where we had already two complaints uh, before the European uh, Ombudsman uh, on actually uh, the ASO involvement at a national level in Greece. I analyzed this in the uh, article I shared uh, uh, at the German Law Journal. So how can we uh, enhance, how can we ensure uh, accountability, knowing that there is also this uh, access to uh, justice gap due to the way that our remedies uh, function at EU level, and we can go further uh, into that uh, in the discussion. Well, first, there are some internal quality mechanisms and notification obligations that are being uh, developed. This is the case of EASO. So as a follow-up uh, to the complaint that was introduced uh, before uh, the Ombudsman, it has developed a known internal equality mechanism and the Ombudsman uh, actually in her uh, opinion said that there are now notification obligations. So when EASO through its own internal quality mechanisms realize that there has been a mistake in the processing that it has undertaken, it has an obligation to notify national uh, Greek authorities. Then there is this development of a flexible extra uh, judicial mechanism for access to justice. We have this ombuds type individual complaints mechanism that is functioning uh, within EASO. It is not functioning optimally as the European Ombudsman has started an own uh, inquiry into Frontex's individual complaints mechanism and the failings therein, but it is a mechanism that could be uh, strengthened and uh, there are not so many blockages, the same blockages that exist with locus standis or with access uh, to uh, the court of uh, justice. So it has some benefits and it could be, of course, it should be further strengthened, the independence, the follow-up, uh, also uh, the means uh, that the fundamental rights officer of Frontex has in her disposal who is uh, running this. So there is a fundamental rights uh, office within uh, Frontex. The new uh, revamped EASO is to have uh, such a similar function as well. This is being negotiated. There is a consultative forum. This is very weak uh, in the case uh, of uh, EASO. It is not a true accountability, let's say, forum in the Bovens uh, sense of uh, accountability. Things are a bit more uh, developed uh, in uh, what concerns uh, Frontex and its a consultative forum, which has uh, the possibility, for example, to conduct on-site visits during operations, etc., etc. So this kind of social accountability, uh, if you want, should also be uh, strengthened. And there is a broader rethink of EU asylum procedural role if we are going to have these deployed experts taking uh, part. We, we have, in fact, uh, what we call in EU administrative law de facto mixed uh, proceedings. And this has not been reflected, not even in the uh, new uh, legislation that is being discussed. So third uh, challenge, uh, to enhance interstate solidarity through agencies. So why did uh, the border uh, member states accept uh, this agency involvement? They certainly uh, did not feel desirous uh, for more EU control or monitoring. They saw it as a way to enhance their capacities. So EU agencies are an indirect vessel for interstate solidarity. Through these operational deployments, they can tap into uh, the EU budget. They can have uh, more, uh, if you want, uh, personnel. So we are gradually moving away uh, from uh, what I have uh, termed in my literature, emergency driven uh, conceptions of solidarity and agency involvement to more uh, structural uh, forms, if you will. This is uh, happening uh, slowly, but
but the realization of this will depend on the resources that the agencies will have and to what extent member states are going to uh, buy in. Even before uh, COVID, uh, their response in what concerns, for example, the employees for uh, EASO, the Asylum Support Office, was pitiful and the Commission always made this reports of naming and shaming, but they very much, let's say, under uh, pledged and did not make available uh, the personnel that the borderline the member states and, and the agencies uh, were asking for. So structural interventions will mean also uh, structural means uh, that should be made available from the EU and from the other uh, member states. Otherwise, it's another uh, growing wish list. And what is the fourth challenge? And I already alluded a bit to this. So it is to square their internal governance structures of these agencies and independence. So it is Deirdre Curtin who has said that EU agencies are betwixt and between, so functionally and institutionally dependent on member states. Uh, and on uh, EU uh, institutions. And their management boards, I already uh, mentioned this, are member states uh, dominated and they have far reaching functions of, for example, endorsing these recommendations coming from the monitoring uh, exercises, of endorsing uh, the outputs, these common uh, positions. And we have these multiple layers of accountability processes, if you want, where, for example, the executive director uh, is accountable to uh, the European Parliament that will uh, grill him or her before uh, the Libe Committee and before their own management uh, boards where the member states might be singing a different tune and wanting uh, different things. And another uh, danger that exists that political scientists, so Ariadna Ripoll-Servent has written uh, about this is actually capture. So strong regulators can capture uh, these uh, management boards. So it is, yes, one vote, one member state, et cetera, et cetera. But in essence, there are different dynamics and the strong regulators can uh, let's say, push uh, on their uh, policy preferences and the agency can become captured and a vessel, uh, let's say, if you want then to implement uh, their policy preference. So these are the four main challenges and this concludes uh, more broadly uh, what I wanted to share with you in my intervention. I will also stop sharing my screen, but I very much uh, look forward to your uh, questions and observations and to continuing the discussion. Thank you so much, Lillian. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I think we can now 